Good evening. I'm Mehdi Hassan. American democracy is under siege tonight from supporters of the president. This is a live look of the scene at the Capitol where not long ago police used tear gas to disperse rioters from the steps. Inside, one person shot has been confirmed killed tonight. And at least one explosive device has been found on Capitol Hill grounds after pro-Trump right-wing extremists stormed the building. The D.C. police chief says several officers have been injured in the fight to secure the Capitol. The army has deployed the National Guard and U.S. Marshals joined the effort to restore order and retake the Capitol. Not a sentence I ever thought I'd be saying on this show. Another historic night, and not one that history is likely to remember kindly, as the district is under curfew at this hour until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. We already knew the Constitution was under siege as today's proceedings were called to order. Lawmakers had gathered to count the Electoral College vote. Mike Pence had already told Donald Trump he was powerless to help him overturn the results. Mitch McConnell, who today is projected to lose control of the Senate, had already informed the chamber he wasn't going to be part of bolstering Trump's sweeping conspiracy theories that the election was stolen and all the other ridiculousness. Ted Cruz had received applause for standing by the president. He had once derided as a sniveling coward. All was going according to script so far. But then Mike Pence was ushered from the chamber and taken to a secure location along with Chuck Grassley, who is third in line uh, to the presidency. And the situation quickly devolved from there into chaos as the rioters established a foothold inside the Capitol. Members of the House were told to put on gas masks and crouch behind their seats as the pro-Trump protesters clashed with police. Astonishing scenes. Guns were drawn as protesters tried to break down the barricaded door to the chamber. Astonishing. The rest of the senators were successfully evacuated to a secure location and are considering continuing their vote count from there. We'll see how many Republicans still dissent when they no longer have the luxury of doing it in front of the television cameras. Senator Jeff Merkley says the Electoral College ballots were saved from being burned by the mob by level-headed floor staff who grabbed them as they fled from the chamber. Speaker Pelosi says the House will reconvene tonight once the Capitol is cleared for use. Let's be clear. The president incited this attack on the Capitol. At a rally beforehand, he fanned the flames of their anger, only to later belatedly, half-heartedly try and douse them by releasing a video message, which we're not going to promote, we're not going to show to you, in which he encouraged the mob at the Capitol to disperse, but, you know, by praising them and sharing more false and unsubstantiated claims that he'd won the election. This is what he said. He said, we love you, you're very special. Those comments will go down alongside very fine people on both sides. The outgoing president starting and finishing his presidency by heaping praise on violent far-right extremists. His replacement, President-elect Joe Biden, said enough is enough. Our democracy is under an unprecedented assault, unlike anything we've seen in modern times. An assault and the Citadel of Liberty, the Capitol itself. An assault on the people's representatives and the Capitol Hill police sworn to protect them and the public servants who work at the heart of our republic. An assault on the rule of law like few times we've ever seen it. This is not dissent. It's disorder. It's chaos. It borders on sedition. And it must end now. There is talk tonight from some House Democrats of invoking the 25th Amendment so that Mike Pence serves out the remaining two weeks of Donald Trump's presidency. Or even new articles of impeachment. The New York Times reports that it was Pence who ordered the National Guard deployed, not Trump. But of course, the first priority is keeping lawmakers safe. Uh, one of the people who was caught in that madness today was Representative Brad Sherman. Uh, he represents California's 30th district. Uh, Congressman, thank you for joining me. Uh, we're very glad you're safe. Thank you for coming on the show. What is going on on Capitol Hill right now? Well, right now we are going to reconvene, I believe in about two hours. We are going to go through the process. I don't expect the Republicans to uh, uh, fail to challenge uh, Georgia or Arizona or Pennsylvania. 
So I expect that we're in for about a 20 hour process, um, delayed a few hours by uh, um, thugs who are trying to disrupt democracy. And can you describe, Congressman, what it was like to be in that building this afternoon, a place so hallowed, uh, so much history behind it, basically desecrated by people who claim to love America? Uh, the Temple of Democracy was desecrated to see uh, tear gas in the rotunda, uh, to see the Senate floor invaded, to see men with drawn pistols defending the House floor. I never thought I'd see it. It's the, uh, you have the world's only superpower uh, losing sovereignty over its Capitol building. Um, that hasn't happened since the War of 1812. I also think we saw the death of the Republican Party today. I think its cause of death was suicide, and the method of suicide was dismemberment. I don't see how uh, this Republican Party can uh, hold on to uh, the extreme Trump cult-like figures uh, at one wing and the Mitch McConnell's Mitt Romney on the other wing and, 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 and fly as a, as a unified party. We may see, have seen uh, the end of the two-party system here today. Those are uh, strong words, I know, from a congressman like yourself. Um, what comes in its place? Because these scenes that we're seeing, these people that we saw today, they're not going away. And yes, there was only a few thousand there today. It wasn't millions of people. But 70 million plus people voted for Donald Trump, many of whom believe the election was stolen, uh, which it wasn't, of course. And you have the president himself inciting this today. I mean, when he went down there in D.C. to speak and when he was saying we need to take back and use strength and not give up and all the other nonsense, I mean, that led directly to this, did it not? I think it did. And then when the rioting and insurrection went forward, the president first did nothing. Then he put out a tweet that said, be peaceful and respect the police, but implied in that was, Occupy the uh, the capital. Don't just just don't kill anybody. And then finally, he uh, put out this video, which included the words "Go home," but sandwiched around that was uh, uh, so many false statements of uh, of uh, about the, the election being stolen, designed to uh, a cause uh, to 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 whip up his uh, his cult like followers. And then, of course, he calls them wonderful people. Um, and as you, as, as you said in, in, in your opening, uh, just like the, uh, his statement about, uh, uh, about the Klansmen in, in Virginia. So uh, it's uh, uh, the, Donald Trump has got to take responsibility for this. He caused it to happen. It could end it. Hey. Do you, Congressman, do you feel safe right now, secure? I do. I do. Um, I, they, uh, I expect that uh, they will have, uh, be able to certify that all of the capital is secure. Not the outside, but the inside of the buildings, which are then connected by tunnels. When I came to work this morning, I thought I was in for uh, uh, 20 hours of uh, what I would call Michigas uh, craziness. Uh, of these uh, challenges, uh, baseless as they are to the votes of Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Well, but what I didn't, and I thought that there'd be lots of crazy people outside screaming. What I did not expect was to yeah. breach the perimeter, which is protected no, by I very serious uh, armed security. I've, I've never imagined that it could be breached, but it was. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people uh, were surprised in the way it was breached. We're going to be talking about that later in the show. I must ask you, we're getting some breaking news while we're on air. I believe Twitter has now locked Donald J. Trump's uh, Twitter account at RealDonaldTrump for 12 hours pending further violations. They'd already belatedly taken down that video, which a lot of people were calling incitement. Uh, number one, is that something you welcome? Number two, that's what Twitter's doing. Are Democrats going to do anything? There's talk of new articles of impeachment. Well... We can do symbolic things to show the country that we really don't like this guy. But the 
the 25th Amendment would require Pence and a majority of the Trump cabinet to turn on Trump. And I see no evidence of that happening. I can't name any one of them who's even thinking about it. Likewise, impeachment yeah. would require two thirds vote in the Senate. Uh, and I think impeachment is serious enough that it shouldn't uh, be rushed through and take place in just a couple of days. And finally, uh, uh, I thought at the beginning of this month that Trump might resign uh, so that Pence could uh, pardon him. So I, I think the relationship between Pence and Trump is not such that he could count on such a pardon today. Uh, but uh, I, uh, uh, I, I think yeah. that uh, we're, we're, we're going to have to survive uh, the next 13 days. Indeed, we are. Uh, and I'm glad you and your colleagues have survived a crazy day today. Congressman Brad Sherman, we are uh, grateful that you're safe and secure at this hour. Appreciate you taking time out uh, to speak with us. Stay safe. In a few short weeks, Joe Biden will be sworn in and these Trump supporters will go back to their communities. We hope, we assume. But what will they be going back to? What will be left of our country? And how much more violence is possible? How did today's violence happen. Joining me now is Clint Watts, distinguished fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, as well as a former special agent in the FBI's Joint Terrorism uh, Task Force. Uh, Clint, thanks for coming on the show. Um, not long after Trump blasted the Republican Party in his speech to supporters today, a pipe bomb was found and detonated by the FBI outside the RNC headquarters, the Republican National Committee, not far from the Capitol. Then a suspicious package led to the evacuation of the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. There were reports of more IEDs on the Capitol ground. Uh, at the moment, I think the FBI is saying that they found, quote, two suspicious explosive devices. I um, have to ask, it, does this count as domestic terrorism? This was your purview at one time. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely, man. It, this is domestic terrorism. It is the use of force or the threat of violence to create political change. It's exactly what they're doing. And there's no place more symbolic than going to the Capitol to do this. I think what's also remarkable is how unprepared they were for this, and that is due in large part because the nation's capital is commanded by the president. I, I, I doubt there was much left in terms of staff, in terms of planning. We've seen most of the leaders going on vacation. Um, if they're not going on vacation, there are new fill-ins. Uh, there was very little left in terms of the federal government to defend this. Uh, and we're seeing now National Guard moving in from Virginia and Maryland. This was predicted, it was well known. Uh, teams that I work with have been preparing yeah. for this for over a week. So we, we're we not surprised by this at all. And we shouldn't be surprised that they got in to the nation's capital when they had already done this in Michigan just a few months ago. Now, I think this is where yes. this takes in an even more dangerous direction. What did we see? We saw the capital stormed in Michigan. And what did we see months later? We saw a militia that was going to try and kidnap the governor of Michigan. Uh, some of the members that were part of that plot were at the Michigan State Capitol. So when you look at once the transfer of power happens here, I think the, what we're going to see going forward is a domestic terrorism situation like we've not seen inside this country probably in centuries. I, I can't imagine any time in recent yeah. history. And look at some of the people that are agitators or part of this. They were people that were pardoned by the president uh, today. Who did, who did you see there? Who did you see there last night? Mike Flynn, Roger Stone, all of the usual instigators that are there. And what do these people do? They're agitators. And they have been talking about what? QAnon, civil war, second civil war. So no, I don't think we'll see a mass army break out in the United States. But I would tell people to remind themselves of the 1990s in this country, which was a much more peaceful time. And we had things like the Atlanta Olympic bombing. We had the Timothy McVeigh bombing in Oklahoma City. We had several other domestic terrorism incidents. I don't see how this movement, if we've got this many people showing up and storming into the Capitol, for them, today is a victory in many ways. When you go to their social media feeds, this is a victory. So I think this is what we really got to be focused on, you know, coming out of January. And Clint, you mentioned rightly uh, some of those episodes from the 90s. Of course, the 1990s was a time when Oklahoma City happened. Bill Clinton comes out and gives a very powerful address to try and tamp down tensions, to try and unite the nation. Here we have a president who's doing the exact opposite. He's inciting the domestic terrorism. It's an amazing sentence to even say, a president inciting terrorism. Uh, tonight, uh, Richard Burr, I believe, Senator Richard Burr, Republican senator, former Intel committee chair, is saying Donald Trump bears responsibility for today's events. Uh, that being the case, 
What happens when he's out of office and he continues inciting violence? Is there any legal channels available to people to try and stop him from doing that? This is the weird uh, phenomenon where we have two codes for terrorism Eddie, in the United States. We have international terrorism, which is really governed by designation of foreign terrorist organizations or foreign terrorists, which goes by the national security yeah. guidelines, a totally different rule book. Domestic terrorism, it is not generally enforced the same way. It's usually based on criminal codes. Some people would argue that that's a strength, that we have just criminal codes, we pursue it as a conspiracy kind of case. However, this is where it gets weird. If you remember back during the war on terror years, we used to worry about a guy named Anwar Alaki, right? An American, and he would incite violence. He would say, this is a target, I want you to show up to it, or I think you should show up to it if you were going to do something. Or have you ever considered you know, using violence in, def in defense of Islam? And he would float these ideas out there. That was seen as incitement to terrorism or incitement to violence. There's almost no yeah. difference here other than the religion and the political philosophy from what we're hearing these individuals say that are the leaders so, of the Trump movement. I'm so glad you said that in that very precise way, Clint, because the other point is not just there's no difference in terms of kind of the religion and the identity. I mean, I have to point out, for people of color watching today's performance of the Capitol Police, there's a lot of questions, as you know. Uh, we saw police behave very violently with tear gas, et cetera, in Lafayette Square when people were doing far less than what they were doing today. We saw in places like Portland, Oregon, Black Lives Matter protests being tear gassed, beaten, assaulted. We saw the NYPD doing all sorts of horrible things last summer. And yet we see the Capitol Police just overrun. I mean, the scenes today where police are being chased by the protesters, I mean, it looks like a double standard to me. Am I wrong? It is a double standard, absolutely. This would never, ever happen in any other situation if it wasn't the president's supporters. And it's largely based on his president. The president's supporters is based on race. It's based on identity. It's based on a political philosophy. We saw during the George Floyd protest and other Black Lives Matter protests, a massive and overwhelming response. Portland, Oregon, you know, that was a largely peaceful protest. And we saw snatch teams deployed into Portland, Oregon. This gentleman here that you're showing that footage of, in 2011, I believe it is, you got to fact check me on this, a, a terrorist essentially was trying to break into the Capitol and he was shot, immediately shot. And the entire time I watched this video yeah, and today- this, I was And this really officer is just running away. Do that, yes. Now, I, I think it's the situation all. is probably different, right? He could be easily overwhelmed. You've got people in that crowd with weapons, yes. right? So he was calling for backup and he did all the right things. But he would have probably been equally right to engage that individual right there who keeps charging him. His, he is there to defend. He doesn't know who's got weapons and they're not obeying orders. So it's a totally different response than what we normally see. It is so frustrating uh, to see that. I know it's not the main issue of today, but it's certainly something worth uh, discussing and pointing out. And I'm glad you did so. Clint Watts, we appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you. Joining us now to bring uh, some historical perspective, and I would argue a big picture perspective that we need, is Timothy Snyder. He's a professor of history at Yale University and author of On Tyranny, 20 Lessons uh, from the 20th Century. Uh, Tim, we've all seen the imagery by now. Uh, we heard President-elect Joe Biden reacting to events today. He said this in a speech. Have a listen. What we're seeing are a small number of extremists dedicated to lawlessness, this is not dissent. It's disorder. It's chaos. It borders on sedition. And it must end now. Tim, Tim, bordering on sedition is Joe Biden's phrase. I heard Republican Adam Kinzinger say earlier it's a coup attempt. Some people are saying treason. Uh, others are referring to uh, insurrections. Do we have language? Uh, that we can use that accurately describes what's happening in the United States Capitol today? Yeah, I, I don't think we have to choose between those terms. I think every single one of them applies, starting small. Um, in the U.S. Criminal Code, there, there is a section on seditious conspiracy, U.S. Criminal Code Section 2384, which seems to cover very well what's happening. Another good word to, 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 to use, I think, is coup. Um, the president has encouraged people to use violence to, in order to illegally remain in power. This is an attempted coup, or if you prefer, putsch. Um, and then rising to, to the highest level and using a word that I'm sure Mr. Biden won't use, if you combine 
a big lie. And this is a big lie. The idea that Mr. Trump won the election is a big lie. If you combine a big lie with ignoring the vote and substituting the violence for the vote, what you're talking about is something which is not just authoritarianism. You're talking about moving very close to having something like a fascist politics in the United States. Yes. And that F word, a lot of people have run away from that F word, uh, including mainstream politicians, including many of my journalistic colleagues. When I used uh, the F word, people said I was guilty of hyperbole, that there was nothing illegal going on. This was all, you know, you may not agree with Trump, but he's not breaking the law. And yet we saw at the weekend uh, him potentially breaking the law in that phone call with the Georgia Secretary of State. And we see today people breaking the law, literally assaulting uh, the United States Capitol. Uh, is it because we only have two parties and even the Democrats are not willing to use such a strong word to describe their colleagues across the aisle. Brad Sherman, congressman from California, just said to me a moment ago, he thinks today is the day the two-party system may have died in America. I, look, I'm, I'm less interested in people running away from the word fascism and more interested in people physically running towards fascism, which is what we're observing mm. now. And I, I think in, in connection with our two-party system, it's very important for the Republicans who are making these objections today to realize that there is a basic, fundamental, ethical, and logical connection between what they are doing and the violence that is taking place. If you tell people a big lie over and over again, if you tell your people a big lie over and over again, what you are calling for is this kind of violence. So I think it's probably right that the Republican Party is going to break in some way or another. But if this is what you want, if you want to tell a big lie, which leads people to storm the building, we are supposed to be contemplating and cogitating and legislating. If this is what you want, then you have to expect that people are going to call this not just authoritarianism, but fascism. I'm afraid this is what it looks like. And this is what it looks like. So what do we do about it? Unfortunately, when we talk about fascism, we think of Nazi Germany, we think of uh, Italy under Mussolini, we think of world wars. Uh, how much violence potentially are we looking at once Joe Biden is in office? Clint Watts uh, a moment ago was just talking about uh, what kind of, we're not going to see a kind of mass armed movement, but we will see acts of violence perhaps on the 1990s Timothy McVeigh model. Yeah, and it seems like a really simple point, but um, we, we, need, we need politicians on Capitol Hill to start speaking simple truths, as some of them are doing. Uh, the longer that this big lie lasts and the more support it has from big media and from important politicians, aside from Mr. Trump, the greater the risk of violence is. This is what we know from history. So there's a very simple thing which people can do to minimize that risk of violence, which is to stop lying and to stop doing it now. If, if you're Senator Hawley or you're Senator Cruz, you might think this is just a game and it doesn't have any consequences, but it does have consequences, not just theoretical consequences. It has consequences for the way that Americans are going to be living for the next several years, for the next several generations. So, of course, we're risking Tip. terrorism. Today is a day of terrorism. It's uh, so depressing to hear you say that, but I'm glad you say it, put it so starkly. Tim, uh, let me ask you this before I let you go. You mentioned Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz. Are they as equally culpable as Trump for what has happened today? Because it's easy to blame Trump. He's crude. He's loud. He talks his way. But someone like C Cruz, Hawley, they're smoother. And yet they're doing the same thing. Before this violence erupted, they were on the floor of the Senate, on the floor of Capitol Hill, trying to overturn an election. Maybe not with violence, but definitely trying to overturn one. I, I, look, in some sense, what they're doing is worse because, of course, they know that this is not true. They're doing it entirely for personal benefit, and they're treating they're treating the the structure and the ethical quality of our republic as if it was just a game in which their political future was the only thing that mattered. What they're doing what they're doing is worse, also in the sense that Trump might go away, right? But their their story is a story of the future. Very true. Very true, very depressing, but we appreciate your insights. We needed that big picture overview. Uh, Tim Snyder, thank you so much for your time. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.